Welcome to the Kara's Care Show, where we explore the cutting edge of wellness. I'm Kara Sundlin. August is Breastfeeding Awareness Month, and because we explore the cutting edge of wellness here for so many moms, this is important because for something that is natural, it doesn't always come naturally. I am joined by a certified lactation consultant, Victoria Ficelli, who is also the author of a brand new book that was actually just released yesterday called Feed the Baby, an inclusive guide to nursing, bottle feeding, everything in between. Victoria, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you know, I, I had the opportunity recently to be at a breastfeeding support group here at University of Connecticut. Nice that they have one, but um, where, you know, even with different babies, it was it's different struggles. And can you just address that um, moms, I know, often want to do this, but it's not always easy, right? Yep. I mean, the thing that I always say, I the reason you can trust me is because I'm the lactation consultant who couldn't feed her kid, right? I had already had a decade in this career. I am a I'm a great lactation consultant, and my daughter um, couldn't nurse. It just was absolutely not going to happen for us. She was bottle fed, and um, that's because of her disability. She has cerebral palsy, but every baby is different. Right. And so I often talk about what's in your control and what's out of your control. And when people get ready to feed babies, we often have an idea of like, OK, I'm going to feed my baby this way. But yeah. at best, you only have control over half that equation. Right. So some babies are born a little early and they're sleepier. Some babies have a tongue tie. Some babies have different sensory needs. And so I always remind folks like babies are people. And so you're going to get a baby that's going to come with all of their uniqueness, all of their personality. And even in between your own babies, you might notice a difference. For sure. Yeah. So let's break that down. So what is in your control when it comes to feeding your baby? So the big thing that's in your control that I always want people to look into is how you prepare and checking in with your own body, right? So we do have some clues. People often think like, oh, maybe large breasts make more milk, small breasts make less milk. That's not true at all. But we can sort of tell things from shape and size and development, whether or not you had big changes to your chest during pregnancy, for instance. If you didn't have any changes during pregnancy, it would be good to check in with a lactation professional. That could mean that you don't make tissue that makes milk. Okay. Um, and so getting in touch with those things, making those plans, finding a lactation consultant before you give birth, choosing a birthplace that you feel really comfortable in, that you feel like you trust the team that you're with, that you trust that they're going to take good care of you. I think those things are really important for people in preparing. Um, and then getting to know a little bit, sort of uh, one of the things I love in my book is that it has QR codes. Oh, I've got my book upside down. Um, to different videos. And so you can watch those videos beforehand and get to know what does nursing actually look like if that is a goal for you. Yeah. How do you actually do that? And watching it beforehand, I think is really helpful, as well as if you're going to bottle feed or your partner's going to bottle feed, teaching them how to do it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can just recall when my daughter was born and they said, are you going to nurse? And I said, yes. And I thought that meant like, I don't know, tomorrow someone's going to come and show me how to do this or something. And they're like, just put her up to your chest. And and uh, and I couldn't believe that there was a little instinct. going. She, she knew what to do a little bit. I mean, we had to work together, but I was floored. Yeah. Like, this is what you mean, like right now. And so obviously every baby is different. And then, you know, there were so many things I didn't know, um, which led to, you know, you can have pain. We didn't have a lot of support at this time at, at the news station. I didn't want to be doing it in the back of a live truck. Uh, you know, things have changed a lot since that 16 years ago. But talk a little bit about what you wish women knew um, before they go on that journey. Yeah, well, that's actually, you know, that pulls in this is World Breastfeeding Week. And the theme for this year is workplace and nursing, right? And so thinking about like, that's a big part of it is what does that look like when you go to work? And so one of the things I want folks to know is you can talk to your workplace beforehand and make a plan. You also, like maybe it just, there was no amount of workplace accommodations that was gonna make your job work with pumping, in which case you get to choose your job. Like that's one of the things I want folks to know is like you get to choose your choice. You get to choose your path. You get to choose what's valuable to you. You get to choose what makes you healthy, what makes your family healthy. And I really want folks to start from that place, to start from a place of what are my values? 
what makes my family feel healthy and then work from that place. So how do I prepare the world around me to meet those needs? So how do I talk to my workplace? I think is important. I think talking to your spouse, talking to your mother-in-law, talking to your parents, talking to anyone who's going to be around during that time to really get everybody on the same page about what your goals are, what your values are, what you want to be working on. Because actually women do have breastfeeding rights. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in the United States, so it's actually, it is different from employer to employer. So an hourly employer of a company over 50 people is required to give breaks for pumping. That being said, other, so that's like a blanket requirement. If you employ fewer than 50 employees, you actually have to apply for an exemption. So most places have not done that, which means that most workplaces really are legally required to accommodate nursing parents. Um, The other thing that I think is true, even though salaried employees are not necessarily, their employers aren't necessarily required to do it. It is good practice, right? If you want retention, if you want to keep the really great people you've already trained, employers know that setting up those accommodations is what's going to keep people, but they don't always know what you're going to need. Yeah. And so sometimes you're going to be the first, you're going to be the trailblazer. Even now in 2023, you might be the trailblazer in your field and you might be the one saying, I can't pump in the back of this truck with a bunch of other anchors. So I'm going to need this option of like, I'm going to need to set up my schedule in this way, or I'm going to need a door with a lock. I'm going to need access to be able to wash my hands, like things like that. And then sometimes you're like, I love my job. It's totally impractical. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to have my bag with my in-bra pump and my hand sanitizer. And like, I'm going to figure it out. And that's part of what I love about my work is that every family is so different. Everyone's priorities are so different. And it's such a puzzle, right? Like, what are you like? What's your baby like? What's your anatomy? What's their anatomy? What's your family system? And how they all come together brings us to how we feed babies. Yeah. And that's why I love that it's not one way. And here at our station, things have, you know, we've grown in the, since uh, my babies were born, but we now have a room with a lock and, and people have places to go. It probably works better for the people who work mostly in the station than the people who are so-called yep. out in the field. But so I guess that makes sense, right? Even if the, the this is still new enough that you might have to advocate and ask, mm-hmm. This is what I mean. But I guess what you're saying is people shouldn't be afraid to do that. Their jobs are protected and they can ask for these things without feeling badly. Absolutely. And then the other piece that I like to remind people of is that you are legally allowed to breastfeed anywhere that you are allowed to be. Oh. So my explanation of this is like, if you do not have medallion status to be in the medallion lounge at the airport, then you cannot nurse in there. Okay. But if you do, then you're allowed to nurse in there. So anywhere that you're allowed to be, you're allowed to nurse your baby. So that gets a little tricky because sometimes people, uh, I guess it's more them, but they might get uncomfortable when someone just starts nursing at a restaurant or in the mall. or uh, and, and that's something that I guess everyone needs to know that this is okay. Women will have different comfort levels of how they do this, but it's okay to do totally. it anywhere. Yep, legally. You know, you get to decide in your community, like who you're comfortable around, who's comfortable around you, but knowing that if someone's uncomfortable, they can absolutely get up and go find somewhere else to be. But legally you are protected in being able to nurse wherever you are because babies get hungry on airplanes. Babies get hungry all kinds of places. What's your advice for a woman who perhaps is like that, like on an airplane next to someone they don't know and they're feeling a little uncomfortable, but they know they have to feed their baby? I think that, you know, nursing is actually pretty close to your body. And so you actually often, it's a little more private than it seems, Mm -hmm. but there are lots of great nursing covers that you can use and have with you. Some of them have like a little piece of wire that actually holds it out away from your body so you can see what you're doing, but other people can't. Um, Or now we have so many amazing pumps that go right into your bra that no one would ever know you're pumping in a big sweatshirt. Really? So you could also always pump and bottle feed on the airplane if that was more comfortable for you. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that. Back in my day, I just remember it seemed like a long time for pumping because... I mean, even my day. You just had to hold Five years ago. (laughs) Like, so now tell us about how the pumping has um, advanced and and, and maybe even does insurance ever cover it now? or, Or how can women pump easily? 
Yep. So that was a big change with the Affordable Care Act that insurance companies, some are grandfathered in, but most insurance companies are now required to cover pumps. So you like call your medical distributing company and they'll tell you what pumps they cover. And if there's a certain pump you want, like a cordless pump, for instance, sometimes you have to pay a little bit of a fee on top of that, but then you can order whatever pump you want. And then beyond that, the world of pumps is just exploding. This is such a huge market. People want to be free. People want to be able to feed their baby their way in whatever circumstance they're in. And so it's really driving a lot of change. It's really driving an exciting movement towards having a lot of options. And so, yeah, gone are the days where people had a little like bicycle horn pump or a, a pump you had to use like like a trombone. And now we have all these options where even um, where either you have cups inside your bra that you're pumping with, where like I could be pumping right now and you wouldn't know. Wow. Or um, and that are connected to a machine that's in a fanny pack, like a pager. I mean, some of them are this big. Oh, my goodness. OK, you would not even believe it. <laughs> um, and then some of them are the actual whole machine is contained in the cup and you just tuck it in and turn it on. Oh my goodness. Okay. So the other thing it's is, a whole new world out there. It's a whole new world. I, 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 I'm sure I'm joking, but maybe you can already do this. Like you could just kind of uh, attach it to some sort of Wi-Fi, and could you just be like, "Hi Alexa, I need to pump," and it just <laughs> who knows? Just about. It's just about there. <laughs> it's just okay. So the good. That's good. I think the more women um, can do this easily. Um, then they can continue because I feel like some women are really feeling like, oh, I'm back to work and my job just doesn't condone it. I guess as women, what we need to know, um, or not condone it, my job doesn't make it easy. Okay, well, we as women need to know it's just like when we have to go in and there's a maternity leave policy. There are these policies that protect your rights to do this. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think continue to advocate, advocate for those policies to expand, helping business owners learn that that actually helps with retention if people can have flexible work and can return to work. I think also supporting paternity leave is really important. Like dads also need to be home. Sometimes those early weeks are really intense while you're learning how to feed a baby yeah. and having both parents home really makes a big difference in people's ability to move through and learn how to feed their babies. And then, yeah, I'm a person where I love all tools. I think tools are totally neutral and you get to use all of the tools that you want. And so having more tools is so great. And that's why like all of the different kinds of pumps, um, different flexible work options, different places to pump, uh, ha having bottles, using formula flexibly when you need to, all of those tools I think are really valuable. So uh, once again, and we've got the book, uh, I'll throw the cover up uh, just in, for those of us who are watching and not just listening in the car, but it's called Feed the Baby. And it's an inclusive guide to all of these things. So do you go through that? I mean, even the basics of tools in your book? I know you said you've got QR codes for all videos. Of it. Okay. So this is, if you're feeling, I don't know any of this, it's in the book. It's in the book. Yep. So we always say in our field, first feed the baby, right? When we're solving a problem, like we're going to figure out whatever mess you're in, but first we feed the baby. So that's why the book is called Feed the Baby. Like I want people to look down at their coffee table and be like, okay, I'm just right now, I just have to feed the baby. Right. right. And then it opens up all of those tools. So the book covers everything from postpartum mood to a friend of mine was joking today. She was like, oh, you should have covered what to do when your dog distracts your baby. And then she was like, just kidding. It's on page 224. Like okay. it really covers <laughs> everything, all of the nursing, how to pump, how to plan for going back to work, how to introduce bottles, how to mix formula, how to choose formula, how to store breast milk, how to store formula, how long it's good on the counter. All of those things yes. are in the book. All those questions, right. And so I love that you made a resource because you yourself, okay, uh, there's a, I'm sure we can Google just about anything, but you yourself had quite the journey. You had your own struggles, but you're also a yeah. certified lactation consultant, which you have recommended. That we kind of want to talk to one of you before the baby comes and probably read this book before the baby comes. That's certainly really helpful. I think people... I think you are in a rare minority that you had the kind of baby, like I would say it's a puzzle. Sometimes like that parent and that baby are just like an easy fit and it sounds like y'all were an easy fit. And I love that. It just like y'all took to it and you still had challenges. 
but that early part was pretty easy for you. It's not like that for a lot of folks. So the more you know, the more you're prepared, the better. So the book is lined out so that it, it tells you, it's sort of like a choose your own adventure where it's like, if you're adopting a baby, if you're using a surrogate, you'll want to go to these pages. If you are pregnant right now, you'll want to read all the way through this section so that you're prepared so that you have that info. And then, yeah, the book has about 50 videos that are only available through the book that take you to just like actual newborn babies actually eating so you can really see what it looks like and see what you're doing. And that two in the morning, when you don't want to Google and look through all the people yeah. and all the videos to be able to just immediately be like, okay, this is what she's talking about. This is what we're doing. And knowledge truly is power. We've reported a lot on the formula shortage. And uh, yes. I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because um, I think people who are not informed have certainly said, well, no formula, no big deal. You can just cook it at home or just breastfeed. And people don't understand how mm -hmm. this doesn't work, especially if you've had trouble with breastfeeding. You're not all of a sudden going to be able to supply your baby. So as this formula shortage yeah. continues, um, what has been, I guess you say there's good and bad about that for families. Yeah, there has been. I think that, so there's a few things of this. So I am an internationally board certified lactation consultant. So our certifying board says that we do not market formula. So we are very careful about that. But I do educate about formula because I think it's important. It's part, we are the foremost experts in feeding babies. And so somebody needs to know really what that means and really be able to teach this. So I do talk a lot about formula in my work. It's very important to me to do so. And the formula shortage, I think, really drew a lot of people's attention to the fact that we need to be talking about this, that we had gotten to a place where our formula production was pretty monopolized and was being made in two main factories, which means that when one of those factories needed to be closed, we had this shock wave go through the entire system. And the things that people don't necessarily think about with this are, yes, if you have not been able to nurse or had to choose not to nurse, and so there's not something else you can feed your baby. You can't whip up some formula in your kitchen. It's very carefully made food. And in order to do that safely, it really needs to be specific infant formula. And so the other piece of that is that some babies really don't tolerate switching between formulas very well. So all of our formulas are certified by the FDA to be safe and healthy for our babies. And some babies can switch between just fine, but most babies will get an upset stomach if you have to switch. Some babies are very specific about the kind of formula that they digest well. So what I always recommend for folks is to never look at the front of the can. Okay. The front of the can is not um, regulated in any way. It's all claims, all the health claims. I want folks to look at the back of the can. So if your brand goes missing with the shortage, which is still very much happening, you can compare these first ingredients to the formula that you've been using and find one that's pretty comparable. The good thing that's come out of the formula shortage is both people's awareness of why it's such an important part of our well-being. It's almost closer to medication than it is to food because it's so irreplaceable. And so we do need to be thinking about that and thinking about our family's well-being. But also it has encouraged the FDA to allow more import of formula, to allow more kinds of formula. So for some babies that maybe have a cow milk allergy or a cow milk intolerance, they might do better on a goat milk formula, which was very hard to find prior to the shortage. And you would mm. have to import it from Europe. And now after the shortage, there are more formulas that are allowed, which both builds redundancy in the system so that if something happens, happens, we have more options, Yeah, but also allows families more choice, which is always a good thing. So I, I wanted to, we have something here called the Channel 3 Mom Squad Facebook group, and it's a place where moms can ask questions. And before I had you on, I, I said, anyone have their questions? So um, I'm looking to see if they're coming in. And there is a woman, Val, who said, um, why are tongue and lip ties not automatically ruled out? She had a terrible time. It was hurting her. Um, they tried to tell her she, her daughter didn't have a lip tie, but a Apparently she did. Uh, I think a lot of people might not even know what that is. Can you talk a little bit about what you should be looking out for as a mom? What is a lip tie and how does that affect nursing? Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about oral ties, so I'm going to show you an illustration from the book so that you can see what I'm talking about. So these little pieces of tissue underneath your lip and underneath your tongue okay. that connect those muscles to the structure of your face 
those can be really tight and they are made of a type of collagen that doesn't actually stretch. So if that frenum comes all the way to the tip of your tongue, you can't move your tongue effectively, which means you're going to use your jaws to chew. Oh. That's going to be really painful and not very effective. So some people aren't in pain, but their production drops. Some people are in a lot of pain with that. What's really tricky is that babies are born so scrunched up, right? They've been on a nine-month car ride like this. Mm -hmm. And so their jaws are really far back. They're all scrunchy and squishy. And so if we are checking every baby for ties, sometimes their jaw is actually so far back at that point that we can't see the tie yet. Okay. Those ties actually change in how they look as a baby develops because using all of these muscles actually pulls the jaw into place. It reduces that funny cone head that some babies are born with and it changes all those muscles. So that allows us to see the tie. Also, not all providers are trained in all things. We sort of think like pediatricians are going to be the experts in everything, but they have to, they really have to be the experts in everything, right? They have to care for everyone zero to 18. That's a huge scope. So they're not always trained in these smaller things. So that's where finding a lactation consultant who is trained in these things or a pediatric dentist, an ENT, or a pediatrician who is trained in identifying those ties is really helpful. And I agree, we need to increase that awareness so that we're looking for those things and so that more providers know how to look for those ties yeah. and how to look not just at what does it look like, but what is the tongue able to do? Because it's really about function. And so it really is a more involved exam than just what does it look like and more about how does the tongue actually move? And I'm so sorry you had such a hard time with that, Val. Um, it's so stressful and it can feel really confusing when different providers are telling you different things. Yeah, she says it took her to the fourth person who diagnosed it. And then once it was clipped. Oh, my um, gosh. As she was, this pain was gone and she was healed. And she did ask for the hospital lactation consultant. I think most of you guys are probably, uh, you know, do an amazing job. But I guess the bottom line is, and this is a lot of mothering, is um, when you have a gut feeling, keep going, <laughs> keep going and keep asking. Yeah, absolutely, keep... absolutely. And those, and like the hospital lactation consultants are seeing a lot of people really quickly. So they're not able to take that time always. Okay. And like I said, it can be harder to identify those ties right at birth. But I agree with you. What I always tell people, people worry, they're like, well, is breastfeeding supposed to hurt? And it should feel like tugging. It should not feel like pinching or rubbing or burning. If any of those things are happening, that's your body's way of telling you something's up. Please get help. Right. And, so I'm and glad that Val continued to, to find too. that help. Yeah, I guess I, I at least I think all of us too, even just getting used to it if it's never been experienced before. Or I, totally. I, both of my kids, I ended up with mastitis, so I had to deal with that. At least the second time, I knew what it was. So there's, I, I guess, there's so yep. much to learn, and not to scare anyone away. But it, you mentioned a lactation consultant would be really great to meet, if possible, like a gold standard. Even learn, read your book, and align with someone before. How would you suggest? Someone or just have their number. Have their number. Right. How would just you have find the phone number one? of a lactation consultant in case you need them. And how do you go about finding one? So there are a few different ways. You can look up the International Board Certification. So um, the IBCLC, if you Google that for your area, name should come up. Um, local doula agencies usually have a great list. Most hospitals and birthplaces have keep a list of who they recommend. Um, and then those parent Facebook groups. Like you will find the people who have the experience in those groups. Your other fellow parents are going to give you exactly the referrals you need. So in our last five minutes together, uh, why is BEST a bigger picture when you're talking about supporting women on this journey and their families? Yeah, this is one of my big soapboxes. So we have this little slogan that came out a while ago about breastfeeding, that breast is best. And for me, that's just way too narrow, that the idea that there could be one thing that's best for families is too narrow. In fact, what we need to look at is a big picture. What is best for your whole family? What is best for your mental health? What is best for the baby in front of you? It would not have been best for my daughter for me to be so focused on breastfeeding and to spend all of our time doing that for months and months and months. What was best for our family was to move on to bottle so that we could do other things, so that we could have joy as a family. For me to be able to get enough protected sleep to treat my my postpartum mood disorder. I had a very severe postpartum mood disorder and I needed 
chunks of protected sleep to be able to heal. And so I think we need to think in a more holistic way about what is best for each family. And for some people, that's absolutely breastfeeding. And for some people, it isn't. And so really opening up just from this narrow idea that breast milk is best into an idea that each family gets to find what for their whole family feels best for them. And there is a lot of judgment, I think, people feeling going into this, like, I have to breastfeed. Um, I've heard breast mm -hmm. is best. And, you know, what about if I don't? Am I hurting my child with allergies and sicknesses or, or whatever? Um, that people are, moms have a lot of guilt. That's just part of what happens, right? So w can you talk a little bit about why you're okay with uh, maybe even combining formula? Yeah, well, we're we're actually starting to get more and more research that indicates that some of the big benefits that we read into breastfeeding are there when you combination feed. So, for instance, the reduction in SIDS appears to be there if you're feeding breast milk and formula as compared to just nursing. So some of those benefits are also there even if you're also using formula. Also, most of those benefits are relatively small. We have always supplemented through all of human history. We have made all manner of weird nonsense to feed our babies because nursing doesn't always work and it has always not always worked. And so we're actually tremendously lucky that formula has gotten so safe and so effective. And it's not foolproof, right? It wasn't less stressful in the last few years to formula feed with the shortage. But it was, but for me, it's about supporting families in whatever that looks like. And each family has good reasons for doing the things the way they do and to really honor the fact that we have more and more good options to support families as a whole unit. Yeah. Um, so it also, uh, you said we need to kind of forget about what we know with adult nutrition. Mm hmm. So this is one of my big things in choosing formula. So when people look, so remember I said, we're not going to look at the front of the can. We're always going to look at the back of the can. And at the back of the can, you have your macronutrients. You have your proteins, your fats, and your carbohydrates. And then it has less than 2%. The Behind the less than 2%, those are the vitamins and minerals. Those are completely standardized. They're the same formula to formula. So you don't need to worry about those. And then you're going to look about what's in front of there. So the first two words on this formula can scare the bejesus out of a lot of families and those two words are corn syrup okay. but really human milk is so sweet we have some of the sweetest milk of any mammals and that's because we have these enormous brains that need so many carbohydrates human milk is mostly sugar the sugar that mammals make is lactose and many formulas have lactose as the first ingredient but that doesn't sit great with all babies stomachs so i often have folks start with a lactose based formula but some babies don't digest it well and so a fructose based formula which corn syrup is just sugar yep. to your baby's body is actually also healthy and great. And that feels so confusing to our adult nutrition brain. Victoria, we're out of time, but I wanna let everyone know they can get the book, Feed great. the Baby. Uh, thank you for sharing so much information. Good luck, moms. You can also find more information uh, on social media at Kara Sundland. Have a great day, be well. Take care, thank you so much. Thank you.